This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, only one mess up in that one, but there's a lot of prophesying to bones and a lot of body parts mentioned there. If you've never actually heard this Bible story of the Valley of Dry Bones, I bet you've heard that song where the knee bone connects to the hip bone, or the leg bone, and the leg bone connects to the hip bone, and the... That's a really fun picture, but I'm imagining that if you actually were to see this happen, it might be a little startling and frightening for you to actually see it. But to begin, I invite you to all take a deep breath. As you breathe in, you often can feel your chest expand, and as you breathe out, you can feel yourselves relax. Take another deep breath. Last week, Pastor Dan asked us all to breathe, to take a deep breath. And he reminded us that in Hebrew, the word breath, wind, and spirit is the word ruach. Can you say ruach? Ruach. The way I tried to explain it to the kids in the children's sermon on Sunday was that it's like a cross between a dinosaur roaring and clearing your throat. So ruach. But it's a special word in Hebrew, and it means breath, and wind, and spirit, depending on the context. And when we were invited to take a deep breath last week, I found that at the same time I felt more calm, and I also felt more awake and more alert. I felt a sense of peace. And I've read in a number of different places that scientists say that most of us don't breathe as deeply as we should on a regular basis. A lot of us do a lot of shallow breathing, which contributes to anxiety and stress and high blood pressure and indigestion and other health issues. But when we take time to actually breathe deeply, it relaxes our muscles. It delivers oxygenated blood to every cell in our bodies. It lowers our blood pressure. It triggers the release of endorphins. It releases toxins or helps our body release toxins. I don't know if you're aware of this, but breathing is very important to life. Like we actually need to breathe in order to live. And so this Hebrew word ruach, it means breath. It means wind. It means spirit. And I have a picture of what the word ruach is in Hebrew. And it may look a little bit not clear to you, but I think that's because you are reading it from left to right, but Hebrew words are read from right to left. Does that clear it up for you? Can you see where it says ruach? (laughs) Okay, so it still just looks like squiggles and a dot and a dash, but... Those are the words that spell ruach. And that is such a rich and powerful word in Hebrew. And we talked about it last week because last week we celebrated Pentecost, which is what we believe is the coming of the Holy Spirit into the church. And the Holy Spirit comes as wind, as breath, and as God's very spirit. And it's a powerful thing. The Holy Spirit part of God is that part of God that's like wind and like breath because it's something that we can't see. And yet it is very important for our lives. We can't see it and yet we can see the effects of it. Just like when we've had all these gale force winds in our area, you can see the effects of it even though you can't see the wind itself. The Holy Spirit is that part of God that breathes new life into things that are lifeless. The Holy Spirit of God is that part of God that is a powerful force to be reckoned with. And so in our story, in our vision that we have from Ezekiel today, we see all three meanings of the word ruach in this Bible passage. We hear about ruach as breath, ruach as spirit, ruach as wind. And so I have some slides that show that for us. 
So first, we have it as breath that brings life to dry bones when it says, Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. And then we also see this described as wind, the wind from God that mobilizes people. It says, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. And then we also hear about this as the very spirit of God that will dwell in the people and help them live with a purpose. So I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. This vivid picture, it paints a picture of what breath can do, of the power of God's spirit. Now the book of Ezekiel in the Old Testament has a number of really startling visions in it. And according to ancient Jewish tradition, people were not allowed to read the book of Ezekiel until they reached the age of wisdom, which was 30. Now I don't know why they decided 30 was the age of wisdom, but do we have anybody who's not 30 yet? Raise your hands. Oh my goodness, you guys weren't supposed to be here when I was sharing with you that passage from Ezekiel. But I didn't learn this till I was in seminary, and I was only 23 when I started seminary, and I felt so rebellious when I read Ezekiel and I wasn't even 30 yet. But I think it was a part of tradition because some of the visions are so disturbing that they thought if you didn't have that age of wisdom yet, that you would just be too startled or disturbed. But since I am kind of a rebel, I always teach some of the visions from Ezekiel to the sixth grade pre-confirmation class. Are you okay? You were there when we read from Ezekiel, right? Okay, but it was freaky, right? Yeah, okay. So I apologize to any parents who have had sixth graders come home with nightmares or go to sleep and have nightmares. But there's some powerful visions in Ezekiel, and this is one of them, one where we see life coming from a place where there didn't look like there could be any life. I mean, it starts out in such a stark way. I mean, this is a valley of dry bones. These aren't just kind of dead death bones. Like, these are really dead, dead bones. I mean, since they're dry bones, that means whatever was living on them died a long time ago. I mean, if you are looking for a situation of lifelessness and death, a valley of dry bones is the place to find that vision. And God gives Ezekiel three prophecies or three messages to share with these bones that get progressively more hope-filled. But I wonder if Ezekiel just felt kind of silly with that first prophecy of prophesying to the bones themselves. Oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. I mean, wouldn't you feel silly standing in the midst of dry bones and saying, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. These things are going to happen. But while he was prophesying, it said something did happen. There was a rattling noise and the bones started to coming together and all these skeletons were assembling and muscles and skin were coming on them. But even though they became fully assembled, then nothing, they weren't alive yet. So that's when he got the second prophecy or the second message to share with these dry bones. And All of a sudden, the wind entered them and it became breath. And they stood on their feet and they were living beings. And all of a sudden, Ezekiel is prophesying to a whole group of living beings who are staring back at him. And so now that they're finally living beings, God tells them the third thing to prophesy to them, that they will know that it is God who is acting. God says, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves and I will bring you back to your homeland and I will put my breath in you. I will put my very spirit in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. Now that must have been a powerful thing to witness. Now the reason that these people, this whole valley of dry bones people were feeling so hopeless is because back in that day, in the time of Israel, 
the Babylonians had attacked and had invaded Israel and all of the people had been driven from their home and the temple in Jerusalem had been destroyed. And these were a group of people who had their identity from the fact that God had promised them this piece of land and that they would worship God in this temple. Now, if they'd been driven out from their land and their temple was destroyed, was God also gone? They didn't know what they had left to count on. They didn't, they'd lost their bearings. They'd lost their identity. When it says that their bones were dried up, the people said, our bones are dried up. That was a common expression for when something is like your bones, it's a part of you. It was essential to who they thought they were. So when they said their bones are dried up, it meant they didn't have a purpose anymore. They didn't know what the point of living was anymore. They didn't know if they were going to make it, and they didn't know if God still remembered them. Everything they knew was gone. That is what the Israelites were feeling, and God compared it to a valley of dry bones. Now, last month, when we had our sermon series about cliches, I showed you some pages from the St. John's Bible. And that's a Bible project from St. John's, Minnesota, um, Saint, in Collegeville at St. John's University, where um, a group of people had a huge undertaking of, like, I think 10 or 15 years where they hand wrote the Bible and hand illustrated the entire Bible. And it's this amazing project where the words of Scripture are the same, but the illustrations that accompany all the words of Scripture include modern events and modern understandings and modern scientific discoveries within it. And one of the images from the St. John's Bible that really haunts me is the one of the Valley of the Dry Bones from Ezekiel 37. And I thought, oh, it's so hard with, this, with the light at this angle here tonight. But you can, um, you can go home and Google it, St. John's Bible, Valley of the Dry Bones, and it'll show you this in better detail. But I want to kind of talk you through what's on this page. The artist, to illustrate the dry bones, wanted to capture what are some of the bones of our modern civilization, those things that are hard and painful for us to bear as a society. It captures the horrible things we've done to each other. So the artist choose, chose to include photo images from genocides in Armenia, Rwanda, Iraq, and Bosnia. There's piles of broken glass from car bombs from all over the world. In the center, close to the center on the left side of the page, there is also a pile of eyeglasses from Auschwitz, which is just a painful symbolic reminder of what happened there in the Holocaust. And then it shows landfills and um, abandoned cars and other pollutants that are filling our environment. And so these things were depicted as the modern bones that our society must reckon with. But even in the midst of this terribly bleak situation and the terrible things that have happened in our world, there is also the presence of God. Now when I talked about the St. John's Bible last month, I said that the way they depicted God was in gold because they could never capture the image of God. But anytime you see gold, it shows the presence of God. And so there are little gold squares that are little gold diamonds that are woven throughout the picture. And there are seven of those gold diamonds to show that God is present even in the midst of all of this terribleness. And that number seven echoes creation I showed the page from the first page of this Bible of the creation story, the first creation story in Genesis 1. And there was a gold square or diamond at the end of each of the seven days of creation to say it is good and God is there. So God is present even in our most terrible struggles. So as we're closing, I wanted you to think about what are some of the bones in your lives? 
to have some of you struggled in valleys of dry bones? What are some of the things in your own life that are too hard for you to bear? Have you ever experienced something that you thought of as essential to you that was taken away or ripped out of your life? And as you think about those hard things, the bones of your life, I want you to breathe and think about where God is in the midst of your valleys of dry bones. And even if you're in the midst of a valley of dry bones right now, God is present. If we look at this vision from Ezekiel, things didn't change all at once. First, there was bones coming together, and then there was muscles, and then there was skin, and then there was breath, and then there was action. But it didn't all happen at once. I think that's often what happens in our own lives. Things don't just poof, get better all of the sudden. But yet we see subtle movements. We hear noises of things happening in our lives. And sometimes if we listen, we can hear God say, I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. Now, this vision is a powerful vision for us individually, but God didn't mean this to just be a vision for individuals. God shared this vision with Ezekiel so that Ezekiel could share it with a whole community of people who needed hope. And so I think this vision is also for this group of people, for this congregation, for this community. I think it's something we can use to help guide us as a congregation. If we are a living, breathing, spirit-filled place who are following God, how can we be people who go out into this community to help people see new life in places where they only see death or only see defeat or cancer or tumors or incarceration or abuse or isolating addiction or infidelity or depression? How can we help others see that even new life coming from those situations? And for people who come into this congregation, how can we be not just merely friendly to people, but how can we open ourselves up and be truly compassionate to one another as we worship together? And how can this place called Good Shepherd be a place where people can bring their whole selves, bones and all, questions and all, and be truly listened and valued? I think that's a great guiding vision for how we can be the spirit-breathed community that God is creating in this vision. But that's a tall order, so how do we begin? The first step is by taking a big breath and letting the spirit enter in. Amen.